So the first uh, talk that we're doing is um, um, is called Water Bryophytes, and it's just really an introductory um, uh, chat and about everything. Okay, so what we're trying to learn from the, this talk is what bryophytes are, what makes them different, and from what the plants. characteristics of the and different divisions of bryophytes are as well. That's better. So, what are bryophytes? Well, bryophytes are non-vascular plants which reproduce from spores, and I'll go through what all this means um, in more detail in a minute. First of all, I just want to introduce you to what is not a bryophyte, but because of the peculiarities of the English language, um, has the word moss or something like that in it. So club mosses are not mosses, they're not bryophytes. Yes. They are actually uh, fern allies, so they reproduce by spores, which that, they have that in common with mosses, but they are vascular plants, so they have a vascular system. Um, this is a picture of one of the common club, more common club mosses um, that was taken at Comedua. Um Another thing which isn't a bryophyte is um, rain. what people sometimes call reindeer moss. Um, reindeer moss is actually a lichen, and lichens are actually not, nothing, have very little to do with, with bryophytes. They are a mutualistic association between a fungus and an alga or a cyanobacterium. So they really are very, very different from, from bryophytes. So now that we know what isn't a bryophyte, let's find out more about actual bryophytes and what they are. So the, they are divided into three major groups. One are the liverworts, and we've got an example here of two types of liverworts. And then we have mosses, and again, pictures of different types of mosses, and hornworts. Now, hornworts, um, there's only four species of hornworts in uh, the UK, and they are not terribly easy to see, um, but they are very similar to liverworts. But the difference, the main difference between um, liverworts and, and hornworts is in the way they reproduce in their reproductive structures. And we'll go through this in more detail later. So just I just want to touch very briefly on taxonomy, um, not the most exciting of subjects. So let's quickly go through it. Um, bryophytes are plants, so they belong to the kingdom of plant plants. They um have there are three phyla or divisions. One is the Macantiophyta, which are the liverworts, the Anthocerotophyta, which are the hornworts, and the Brigophyta, which take in all the different mosses. We'll now go into more detail and look at the uh, differences between the mosses and liverworts and hornworts. So the Macantiophyta or liverworts are divided into two different types. One type, the thallus liverworts, effectively don't have separate leaves and stem. They are just one thallus, which is basically a plate of tissue. And you can see on the, the left-hand side, a thallus liverwort. It consists of a plate of tissue with no distinct leaves or stem. Whereas if you look at the picture on the right hand side, that's clearly got one main stem and leaves on either side of the stem. And in this case, it even has a set of leaves on the back of the stem, which are called under leaves. And we'll go into more detail on um, what the, the complexities of leafy liverworts in a bit. Hornworts um, and the I've already explained, are very similar to thallus liverworts at a glance but the main difference is in the way they reproduce. So their reproductive structures um, are much simpler and less sort of structured than um, liverwort ones. Um, and they're these green horns, which is probably where the name hornworts come from. Um, and finally, the Briophyta mosses, and they are divided into different divisions, subdivisions, let's call them, Acrocarpus mosses, Pleurocarpus mosses, and Sphagnum. And we'll talk about this in more detail. 
Now, before we start and talk about bryophytes, I just want to quickly touch over on what uh, makes bryophytes different from vascular plants. One of the um, interesting thing about um, mosses and liverworts is that they the the long lived part of the plant, the plant that you actually see all the time, um, is um, a gametophyte. So it's um, a, a a structure that only has one set of chromosomes instead of having two sets of chromosomes. So the only um, the the main generation, the cold generation, the gametophyte generation, the uh, sporophyte generation. So the gametophyte generation, which is the, the long-lived one, um, is the one that has only one set of chromosomes. But vascular plants is is the other way around, where the long-lived part of, a, of um, the plant that you see um, all the time is the sporophyte. So that's one of the main main differences. And when you have a look at what the difference is in particular, um, the long-lived part of um, the, um, um, the sorry, the the, the uh, I think the metaphytic generation in vascular plants is very very small and minor. So the only part of the gametophytes of the um, of a of a plant are the pollen and the embryo sac. Everything else has two sets of chromosomes and therefore is part of the um, sporophyte generation. So you don't really need to know that to learn to identify them, but it's just one of the main differences that is kind of difficult not to sort of just to sort of gloss over because it is a main you know, difference between the two types of plants. So here we got, um, we've got a picture of the diploid structures of bryophytes, which are the seta and the stalk and the capsule. So the seta is a stalk, and you can see here that it's red, it's the red stalks. And the, the capsule is this pendant capsule that term, um, in this particular moss is, 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 um, um, going down pendant is almost pendant basically and the interesting thing about the gametophyte generation and it is that it supports the sporophyte generation so it feeds it the sporophytes are dependent on the gametophyte for a long time because they they do eventually um, uh, produce some food through um, photosynthesis, but at the beginning they rely entirely on the gametophyte for um, su survival, effectively. Another major difference between um, bryophytes and vascular plants is how they cope with lack of, lack of water. So what has um, how they evolved to cope with lack of water is completely different from vascular plants. So vascular plants have basically controlled the state of hydration by using internal mechanisms. You know that plants take water up from the roots and then there's, they have a system that brings nutrients down to the roots from the leaves. Um, but effectively, that's the silen and the phloem. Um, bryophytes don't have a lignified vascular system that connects to the leaves they have ways of transporting water but they're very rudimentary you know, through capillary action so the way they deal with changes in the environment and lack of water is by the by uh, being desiccation tolerant so if there isn't enough water they just dry up they suspend their metabolism and they wait for the water to come and um this is a picture of a porocarpus moss a very common one, Homolithesium sericium. Um, when it's dry, you can clearly see from the picture, it all the the leaves are stuck onto the, the they're effectively pressed onto the branches, and the branches themselves stick up and form um, as, away from the main um, stem. As soon as you put water in it, and this is I just sprayed it with water. You can see that it's kind of forming, um, it's much more uh, fluffy. Effectively, the leaves are opening out and the branches are opening out and it gives it a completely different look. And this is something to be aware of when you're looking at bryophytes and you're trying to identify them, 
they can look incredibly different when they're dry from when they are wet. And that's something to just bear in mind for future reference. Okay, moving on to uh, um, the different types of um, bryophytes now. So when you find what you think is a bryophyte, what do you think you have? Do you have a liverwort? Do you have a moss? Or do you have a sphagnum? And we have a closer look at the different types of bryophytes um, in the next few slides. Okay, so thallus liverworts, we've already mentioned, don't have leaves, separate leaves and separate stem. They just have one plate of tissue and um, that's and which photosynthesizes and constitutes the whole plant and you can see from this picture of pelia that uh, the green sort of flat thalli that's what i call bits of tissue are the gametophyte and then in this picture you also can see the sporophytes so the sporophytes have a see-through stem from stalk if you want to call it it's not a stem it's a stalk which is called a seta and then the little black spherical structure is the capsule. And inside the capsules, this capsule is are the spores. Now, so, uh, liverwort capsules are very simple. They just have, they're just spherical. And when they need to open, they just split into four and the um, uh, spores come out. One thing about thallus liverworts is that you can have different types of um, thallus um, characteristics that help you identify thallus liverworts. Some liverworts have very, very thick thalli, which in this case, Conochephalum conicum has a very, very thick thallus that even has got ornamental features on it. This one looks like it's um, got crazy paving, um, pick, you know, sort of ornamentation on it. And the polygonal markings are very distinctive and they make it quite easy to, to um, pick out. By contrast, if you look at this um, very thin liverwort, it's still a thallus liverwort, but it has a very thin thallus, which is only one cell thick. And you can see from the picture on the left-hand side how thin it is because you can almost see through it. Well, you can effectively see through it. Um, and in this case, ornamentation-wise, it has a midrib uh, running into the centre. So two very different Thallus liverworts. Um, one um, interesting feature about Thallus liverworts is that they have rhizoids, which... Um, we haven't mentioned yet, so they are effectively what helps a the plant to anchor itself to the substrate. So they're a bit like roots, but they don't perform the job of um, absorbing water. They just anchor the plant to the substrate. And these long hair-like um, um, structures that you can see from the picture on the um, um, right hand side are the rhizoids of a thallus liverwort and if you look carefully in the, in the corner and for, in, in the uh, yellow circle in the picture on the left hand side there are some rhizoids sticking out from underneath the thallus and in liverworts rhizoids are unicellular structures whereas in mosses they have more than one cell one interesting feature of all bryophytes, and we'll introduce it with the thallus liverworts, is the fact that they often reproduce asexually. So instead of producing a sporophyte, which is the result of um, fertilization um, and, and sexual reproduction, they just produce bits of themselves, in one way or another, that can then fall on the substrate and reproduce a whole plant, which of course is going to be a um, completely genetic uh, um, clone of the mother plant. But it's a really successful way of reproducing without, um, if, even if there isn't a, a female or a male around, so any, any plant can just reproduce itself. So in this case, there is um, this liverwort is called Lunularia cruciata, and it has these so-called um, geme cups, and geme is the name that you give to the disc 
discoid, discoid looking reproductive structures inside the cup. So that's one example of vegetative propagation. Now, moving on to the leafy liverworts, you can see the difference between a leafy liverwort and a thallus liverwort that we've seen that we looked at so far. The leafy liverworts definitely have a stem, and you can clearly see the stem running in the middle. And then they have leaves either side of the stem running up the stem. And in this, in the case of this species, which is a very common liverwort called Rafficodia bidentata, you also have under leaves. So the under leaves um, are basically attached to the back of the stem, if you want to call it the back of the stem, the part of the stem that attaches, that's closest to the substrate. And as you can tell from the pictures, um, the shape of the underleaf is very different in this, in this species from the shape of the main leaves, completely different. And this is a feature that happens very often with um, leafy liverworts. If they have underleaves, sometimes they're different from um, the main leaves. Um, just to introduce you to complexity, so liverworts are very small, tend to be quite small in size, but they seem to have gone to town when it comes to features that, to, I don't know, maybe trap water or that increase the surface um, the, the surface areas or something like that. So they seem to produce lots of very complicated structures. So this liverwort, which is Frelenia tamarisii, has clearly got a stem. In this case, it forks off and it has a little branch. And then it has got leaves either side of the stem, which are rounded. And you can see them very clearly. But also you can see these kind of odd helmet-like structures, which are called lobules. So these are still attached to the main leaf. But they're almost, they're well, they effectively are like helmets and they are very good at trapping water. And uh, sometimes they trap air, which is why they've got air bubbles when you put them under the microscope. And in addition to the main leaves, the lobules, you also have under leaves. And in this species, they are quite large and um, you can see them all along the stem. They've got a bit of a dip at the tip. So this liverwort is tiny, and despite being so tiny, it has so much detail in um, um, in its structure that it just um, you know it's uh, never called liverworts simple simple plants because they're not <laughs> they're primitive but they're not simple. Um, moving on to um, the way they reproduce, and again uh, we've got. Um, a picture here of a very small liverwort called Cephalosia bicuspidata, and the sort of inflated structures that you see poking out um, are the, the perians, which basically are modified leaves that envelop the female, so the egg, um, and also the developing capsule. And in this species, the reason why I put this picture is the fact that the the, the perians and the capsule are so much bigger than the main shoot. So when you look at the main shoot, is um, um, there's an arrow pointing at the one shoot. The leaves are, are tiny and the stem is quite tiny, but the the actual perianth is almost the size of a whole shoot. So it's it's very huge compared to the size of the plant. It's just a peculiarity which I think is really interesting. Moving on to mosses. Uh, there are two different types of mosses, well, three different types of mosses, excluding sphagnum, which we will deal with um, later. But the, the two main differences between the mosses are acrocarpus mosses and plurocarpus mosses. So how do you tell the two apart? Mostly in the way the structure, the, the way they grow and where the sporophyte is attached. So as a general rule, Acrocarpus mosses grow upright. Each, each of the shoots goes, grows upright. They're usually unbranched. No, they're usually, because sometimes they can be branched, but usually unbranched. And the sporophytes arise from the tip of the main stem. And in this case, you can see from the picture, there is definitely a little plant at the bottom. And then the sporophyte comes up from the tip of the shoot. 
and there is a capsule which is still immature and it's very very thin so it hasn't formed a nice thick capsule yet and it's covered by a calyptra which is basically well a hat which is basically a protection one of the layers of protection the first layer of protection of a capsule um I talk about acrocarpus mosses. Another feature that can point you towards thinking, I have an acrocarpus moss, is when you have a, a moss that's got this kind of whitish appearance to it. Because when you look carefully at the leaves, the tip of the leaves have got a see through hair point on the tip. And a classic example is the really common moss, Torsia muralis, that Torsia muralis grows on every wall that you walk past in every town. Um, and it's got this kind of whitish look about it. The white look, hoary kind of look, is given by the hair point. And pleurocarpus mosses never have a hair point. They might have long drawn out leaf points, but they are they have chlorophyll in them. This the um hair points in um acrocarpus mosses don't have chlorophyll, they're just completely see-through. We looked at vegetative reproduction in liverworts, um, the gemme, the little bits of discoid gemme that um, are produced and uh, which drop off and form a new plant, which is a clone of the mother plant. Well, acrocarpus mosses do a similar thing. They produce sometimes gemme, but in this case, I, um, for this particular species, they produce a more complex um, sort of pro vegetative propagule, which is consists of a tiny bit of stem, a few leaves, and they detach from the main stem, and you can see them circled in, in yellow, and they fall off, and from that one little bit of a few leaves and a bit of stem, a new plant can grow. So that's another way of um, reproducing um, vegetatively. And this species, Campylopus, and the genus Campylopus does this quite often. Another unusual, well, particular characteristic of um, a genus of moss, of um, Acrocarpus mosses called Fissidens, is that they have modifications um, in the leaves that allows them to hold on to water uh, more, more easily. They have effectively a pocket inside the leaf, and I think the English name of uh, Fissidens is pocket moss. Um, the leaf is, is um, doubled up effectively into a pocket that where they where it joins with, up with the stem and this is a characteristic of this particular genus um which makes it look and um, it, it's got some very flattened and makes it look almost like a little polypody fern um but the interesting characteristic is the fact that they've got this pocket that allows it to hold water and this is what it looks like in in situ in, when you see it on a bank um, with sporophytes, producing sporophytes. And um, again, we talked about rhizoids in liverworts, and we can see the rhizoids in mosses. They also have rhizoids. And in this particular picture, again, circled in um, yellow, you can see the rhizoids um, almost, in this case, they really look like... Um, um, uh, roots because they're right at the bottom of the shoot but because this species lives effectively grows onto um, um, banks um, of soil they effectively uh, anchor the plant onto the soil and when you pull it up like I did in this case it comes up with all the soil attached to it. Moving on to pleurocarpus mosses now so pleurocarpus we've seen the acrocarpus mosses have a upright growth with the sporophyte growing from the tip of the shoot. Um, Pleurocarpus mosses have a creeping habit. So they first creep and then they form branches that go up. And they grow one on top of the other, forming wefts. The sporophytes, instead of arising from the tip of the shoot, arises from specialized side, side branches that are very difficult to see in pictures. But um, effectively, they are tiny, tiny little branches that at the tip have um, 
a sporophyte growing on it. And you can see in this picture, you have sporophytes that some of, some of them still have calyptras on these hats, which look a bit like whitish, like a whitish shroud. Um, the seater, obviously, um, which make them rise up above the main cushion. And um, some of them have lost their um, calyptra and you can see the capsules. And we can look at this in more detail. So this moss, um, this is Pleurocarpus moss as well. Um, you can see the sporophyte with the long seater. The sporophyte on the right hand side still have the, has the lid on the capsule. Whereas the one on the left hand side, you can see the so-called peristome teeth. So peristome teeth um, effectively are, well, they are teeth that open and close according to whether it's damp or not. And they regulate the um, how, how the spores can come in and out, well, not in, out of the capsule. So the peristome teeth are quite long and they close up and they form um, a barrier. So when, say, it's very wet or um, there is no wind that can disperse the spores, they will close. And when the wind comes up, they will open out and allow the spores to come out and to disperse. So as you can see, it's very different from the capsule of a liverwort, which was just a simple capsule, no lid, just splits into four and opens out and the, and the, and the um, spores come out. That's in more detail, the peristome teeth and the lid in uh, that same um, moss that we've seen before. Um, when talking about mosses, I have to show you a really common one that you'll all have in your lawn. And you can go and have a look and see if it's if you've got a lawn or a park near you, go and look for this moss because it's really common. It is a pleurocarpus moss, so it starts off growing um, horizontally and then it branches up vertically. Um, but one of the characteristics about this uh, moss, which makes it easy to recognize, is that the leaves all stick out from the main stem. And when you look at them end on, they've got this kind of starry look about them. And um, so if you go and have a look in the lawn and try and find it, it's um it's yeah, quite quite a common moss. But it's worth mentioning at this point. We looked at rhizoids in liverworts, um, in um, acrocarpus mosses, and now just this picture was um, it's from a, a moss called um, Palustriella, um, which has got lots of rhizoids and oddly attached to the leaf instead of being attached to the stem or to the bottom of the stem they they are there as well but in this case they are all over and they even um, they're even attached to um one bit of the leaf so um, rhizoids are yes for um, um anchoring the plant but they seem to be used for other things as well they seem to clo clothe the stem sometimes or be attached to the leaves and again i wonder whether this is to do with trying to um increase the surface area and try to hold on to water. So that's an interesting, and you can see how much longer they are than the ones we saw for the liverworts. They were quite short in liverworts and they're just uni unicellular, whereas these ones are quite long in multicellular. Moving on to the third type of moss is the sphagnum, um, or the sphagnum plural, but in this case, sphagnum papillosum. And just to give you an idea, they look very distinctive because they have, instead of having either, well, they have an upright growth. So in that, in that way, they, they are very similar to acrocarpus mosses. But they, instead of having branches that come up here, there and everywhere, they have branches, they have a main stem and branches that come out in groups of three or more from a one point along the stem and then another one nearby and so on. So you can see the branches are all around, but they come out from an individual, as, as a group from an individual point and so on. Um, the tip, the growing tip of the moss is at the very tip of the shoot. It's called a capitulum and it contains effectively young collapsed branches, really, really tiny branches that as it grows, get longer and longer. 
and become the branches that you then see. Mosses, I mean, sphagnum are really important and they are um, incredibly, well, they're, they're called ecosystem um, builders because they effectively have a way of holding on to water, which is what they do mostly. They have dead cells inside them that hold on to water. And they, uh, by holding on to water and keeping um, keeping their water table high, they effectively create their own ecosystem and they never they 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 stop um, the um, uh, decay of of the actual sort of shoot as as it grows up the bottom never decays because it's in water and it can't um, effectively it can't decompose aerobically and it, it's it's in an aerobic uh, uh, environment so it can't decompose so sphagnum papillosum effectively is a bog the bog creator it creates. Uh, peatlands and bog. It's uh, extremely important from an ecological perspective. Um, you can see from this picture um, another type of moss, which um, is really quite common, um, sphagnum capillifolium, which forms these really dense um, hummocks in wet heath, but also blanket bog. And next to it, it's sort of um, cousin, I would say, um, sphagnum rebellum. Um, they've been now split into two. Uh, there used to be one species, and again, the they are extremely important because with sphagnum papillosum, they create um, they they create peat in there for the bog. And you can see from this picture, again, the uh, strangely, this one has split into two, has two capitulas, so it's growing from two different points, well, probably because of damage. But you can see the branches at the tip in the capitulum, smaller branches. And then the branches from um, growing in bunches or fascicles along the stem. Right, so this is a kind of a quick uh, <laughs> summary of what we've just gone through. So we know that bryophytes are non vascular plants which reproduce from spores. And they belong to the kingdom of plants, and there are three divisions. Micro uh, Mycantiophyta or liverworts, the Anthocerotophyta, hornworts, and the Bryophyta, the mosses. And we know that the long lived structures of a bryophyte, the leaves, the stem, and the rhizoids, belong to the gametophyte generation, which is haploid. And that the diploid structures of bryophytes, the sporophytes, are short lived and they are dependent on the gametophyte. And bryophytes don't have um, lignified. And vascular tissue which connects the leaves and um, the way they deal with um, lack of water is simply by being desiccation tolerant and if there's not enough water they just shut down their metabolism and start again when water returns. Different types of bryophytes, liverworts and they can be thallus or leafy, mosses which are divided into acrocarpus mosses, purocarpus mosses and sphagnum and um, uh, hornworts, which um, uh, there's only four in um, uh, the UK, and they look very similar to um, liberal worts. <laughs>